today for the CITP Lunchtime Seminar. Today we have as a speaker Bill Marino, uh, who's going to talk to us about smart contracts and contract law. Um, he knows a lot about this topic because he's uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time recently at uh, Cornell Tech working on uh, related topics at, in the uh, Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Contracts there. Um, he also has a JD from Columbia and uh, also studied uh, undergrad uh, from Yale. So uh, he's, and I think now I can officially announce he's also a CITP affiliate. So uh, without further ado, uh, Bill. Thanks so much, Nick. Away. Thank you so much. Uh, really honored to be here. We can keep this very casual and very interactive. So if folks have questions or anything, feel free to just chime in. Um, I'm going to be floating some kind of new thinking of mine. So I'm just as kind of interested in your reaction to it as you are in it. Um, yeah, so let's talk about the relationship between smart contracts and contract law, which is sometimes an uneasy relationship. Um, Nick gave me a great bio, so I'll skip all, all of this, um, and let's get to the good stuff. So smart contracts, you guys probably have read this term in the newspapers and so forth. Um, so my first question is, does anyone want to throw out a definition of smart contracts? It's okay. If you're, uh, don't, you know, it's okay if everyone is shy, and you shouldn't be shy because I think smart contracts is one of the one of these words, kind of like data science, which really we have not pinned it to an exact meaning. And in fact, I think I think there's a lot of actually conflicting meanings. Um, is yeah. It a play on like smartphones, like phones that you, like, on some, oh yeah, on some level it is. Anyone else like want to venture a definition of smart contract? Has anyone else read this term like in the newspapers? Yes, Bob. Okay, that's okay. Um, so let's uh, let's actually go then to a definition of smart contract. You're guaranteed to keep hearing this word in the future. So I'm actually on some level glad that I get to be the one to kind of introduce you to it. Um, when I for a long time when um, you know I tried to define smart contracts. I went back to the, these kind of seminal writings on the, the topic of smart contracts uh, by this guy named Nick Zabo. Uh, and he put these writings out in the late 90s. You can still find them online. Uh, fortunately enough, they still have the same amazing web design as they did in the 90s, which I really appreciate. <laughs> um, so, so Nick, inside these, these writings, um, floats this definition of, of a smart contract that I've circled back to over and over again. And, and later on, we'll talk about the fact that you know, this is certainly not the only definition out there. But it's, it's one that has a lot of value. So let me just read kind of through this. Nick says, the basic idea of smart contracts is that many kinds of contractual clauses can be embedded in hardware and software in such a way as to make breach of contract expensive, if desired, sometimes prohibitively so. And actually, the, the kind of uh, example that Nick gives for a smart contract is maybe surprisingly a vending machine. Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, you know, you and I can have a an agreement to buy and sell, for example, a gumball, right? And this agreement will have will have all kinds of terms. Maybe um, I pay you a quarter for for this gumball, and if if you have no more gumballs, or if the quarter that I pay you is counterfeit, or if it's, it's not a quarter, it's a dime, maybe you, do, you just return me the quarter, OK? And otherwise, uh, if everything checks out, then you return me a gumball, right? So we could have this contract. Or what we could do, uh, we could have a paper contract, we could have an oral agreement. Uh, it's very easy to breach this kind of agreement, right? Um, all I have to do is just not, you know, give, you know I, I slip my quarter in, you don't give me the gumball, you've breached the agreement. Um, what we can do, though, is we can take these same kind of contractual terms and, like Nick said, embed them in hardware and software. And in this case, what we do is we embed them inside the gears and the, the coin return of the vending machine or the gumball machine. I don't know too much about gumball machine mechanics, but I think those are parts of a gumball machine. Um, and now, now what happens is we've kind of we've taken those contract terms, if we, we've embedded them in a system such that they sort of automatically execute, right? If I, um, a vending machine actually represents like a standing offer. 
And by putting your money in, you're accepting that offer and you're creating a contract. Okay. Um, so uh, if if I slid my quarter to this gumball machine and we've set up all the gears and everything correctly, then it's just going to kind of automatically execute. And this is kind of Nick's prototypical example of a smart contract, right? Because again, we've taken contractual terms, we've embedded them in some kind of hardware or software such that breaching our agreement now becomes a lot more difficult, right? Once I've slipped that quarter in, I'm gonna get the gumball pretty much. It's, it's almost guaranteed. Uh, in the modern era, you know, um, we've come a long way since Nick's, uh, you know, vending machine days. And I think the, the, the kind of, the way that you'll hear a lot of folks now talking about building smart contracts is often um, on the blockchain, especially on this platform, Ethereum. And now here's kind of the money question. Uh, how many folks are familiar with Ethereum? It's okay if no one is. I'll, I'll kind of like go through it a little bit. All right, there's like six hands. And how many folks are pretty familiar with, block, with blockchain? All right, slightly more hands. So why don't we just run through it? I'd rather kind of have everyone leave this room feeling pretty confident about blockchain and about Ethereum. I think you're going to read a lot about it in the future. Some of you might have read a lot about it over the summer um, with this whole like DAO incident, which we'll, we'll talk about uh, later on. So let's just run through like, like uh, Ethereum. So the story of Ethereum starts with the blockchain, and the story of the blockchain really starts uh, with the Bitcoin blockchain. So, uh, and, and probably everyone here has heard of Bitcoin, right? Okay. So, um, you know, when Bitcoin, when the Bitcoin protocol was published in 2008, there is two primary innovations of Bitcoin. One, of course, is the virtual currency, and that's probably what you guys all know, right? The virtual currency. If you go into a coffee shop and you see a little Bitcoin symbol, you know, that you probably say like, oh, that's a virtual currency. I can pay with that. Uh, the, the other innovation you might be a little less familiar with is the distributed ledger that keeps track of who owns all of the Bitcoins. And that is called blockchain. Um, roughly speaking, how does it work? So uh, there is a system of distributed computers. These are called nodes in the Bitcoin network. I, I can't remember how, someone can yell it out if they remember how much it is. It's like, I think it was like 6,000 a year ago, but it might be like more or less now, I actually, I don't know. Um, so all of these computers work together to maintain this ledger of transactions. Again, who owns the Bitcoins? So it, more, to get a little bit more specifically, if I send Bob here some Bitcoins, uh, that transaction uh, is going to be sent to every node in the Bitcoin network, all of these different computers. They're going to verify it. And then if it checks out, they're going to add it to this list of transactions, which roughly speaking is called the blockchain. Just to, like kind of loop back over a couple principles here. Every node in um, the Bitcoin network has a copy of the entire blockchain. Uh, and again, to add a new entry to the blockchain, all of the nodes have to agree. It all has to check out with every node. And this is another key part, and this is going to play an important role when we start talking about smart contracts again. Uh, the ledger is immutable. So once, once an entry or a transaction is added to this ledger, it cannot be removed. And there's a lot of cryptological controls in place to make sure that the blockchain is immutable and cannot be corrupted uh, afterward. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, a couple years back, about two, two and a half years back, you know, some folks had the novel idea. They said, look, like, what if instead of putting kind of transactions on this blockchain, uh, we put blocks of code, blobs of code on there, okay? And then what if all of these different computers in the network, instead of just kind of processing these transactions and making them check out, making sure they check out, could also run the code inside these blobs. What would that give us? Well, it gives us a way to, um, an entirely distributed way to run applications and programs. These programs don't sit on any one server. They sit on the entire network. No one entity, unless it gains control of the entire network, or at least a you know, majority of it, um, can stop those programs from being run when they're called. They're immutable, and that's pretty much the idea behind Ethereum, okay? Uh, so what does this have to do with smart contracts? Uh, a couple things, a couple other things first. Um, 
note that on Ethereum as well, these kind of blobs of code which have taken the possibly unfortunate handle contracts, and we'll talk about that too, uh, they have their own addresses, and they can hold and send virtual currency. Uh, they can also hold states, variables, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, you can have functions inside these code blobs that can do things like shuttle around um, that currency, shuttle around data. So now what you can start doing with these things is you can really start mimicking kind of contract terms, okay? You can send, you can tell your blob of code to send a payment to this person at this time. Maybe if, if this certain condition is met, uh, you can send, you know, tell it to send data to this person at this time. And now we're really getting to a point where we can, um, like Nick Zabo was talking about, embed the terms of, of a contract inside this software. And again, because it's immutable, once you have it there and you have the terms embedded, it becomes much more difficult to breach. Um, so uh, one, one thing I just want to point out here, this is like kind of a reoccurring theme, uh, with both the, the vending machine in Nick's examples from the 90s uh, and Ethereum, one thing that they share and maybe that all smart contract models or embodiments share is this notion of like security and immutability. So why, why security? So if we are embedding contract terms in hardware and software, then one thing that you can do to breach that agreement, even after it's embedded, is to disrupt the hardware or the software, right? To, to break it. If you break the hardware or the software that cont contains the contract's terms, then you can breach, breach by disruption. I've been calling it. I don't know if there's a better name. Um, so, so oftentimes security measures are taken to kind of to guard against this particular brand of breach, okay? And that often means making the kind of smart contract embodiment immutable in some fashion. You saw it with the vending machine. Once that vending machine is, is built and constructed, um, there's not really a way to, to disrupt it. Um, and the, the same with the blockchain. Um, it's secured, it's immutable. And this, these kind of qualities like give rise to, I think, a lot of the things that folks like about smart contracts. So if you read about smart contracts, um, especially blo blockchain smart contracts, you'll read about this notion of like trustless trust. Uh, you know, once we put this thing on the blockchain and it's there and it's immutable, uh, I can trust it even if, even if I don't know the other party that I'm contracting with. Uh, automatic enforcement, you know, once we set this thing up and we initialize it, it's going to automatically enforce its terms. So a lot of these like kind of benefits come from this notion of security and immutability. Um, and that's gonna play a later role. So just kind of keep that on the top of your mind. So let's talk now about the relationship between smart contracts and contract law. Um, one of, I think, my recent observations, and this is kind of like the idea that I'm interested to uh, float in front of everyone here, is that there are a couple very different paradigms um, of thinking about the relationship between smart contracts and, con and contract law. And I think those paradigms define uh, exactly how uneasy the relationship is between smart contracts and contract law. And they also kind of identify the particular thorns in the relationship uh, that are worth focusing on. So again, if we go back to the Nick's, Nick's kind of language there, that definition of a smart contract that I really liked, if you reread it and you kind of look at the language, you'll see that um, Nick's idea of a smart contract falls squarely inside contract law. Uh, he's not here to disrupt or dispense with contract law. Uh, to compete with it, I think under Nick's definition and a lot of folks' definitions of smart contracts, smart contracts are here to help contract law. Um, and I, this is the, I kind of call this paradigm of thinking smart contracts enhance contract law. And actually, yes? Going back to that definition. Yeah. so much from the um, 
Sure. Sure. So, do you mean like in one of the particular kind of contract embodiments that I discussed? Yeah, because it should go two ways, right? Sure. So, um, but I don't see yeah. The seller is going to give the gumbo. Yeah. To the buyer, um, you know, puts in the formula. So, what kind of consequences do we face that are expensive? Or, you know, what kind of mechanisms? Well, the mechanism would probably be the, the code that gets run to Vertex. And if you put in, mm -hmm. what, how is it expensive? Sure. So in an ideal world, I think you want both parties in a contract. And bear in mind, there could be many, many parties in a contract. Um, you want it for, to be very difficult, cost prohibitive, or maybe even impossible for either to breach. So I understand like the vending machine is a little hard to kind of understand how um, each party would breach. But let's say, for example, uh, I'm, I'm the company that owns uh, the vending machine, right? someone inserts a quarter, um, my breach would be simply to like just not return a gumball to them, right? So um, by kind of sealing these contract terms in hardware, and look, we've all put a quarter in a gumball machine and not, or a Coke machine and not gone back our Coke. It sure, certainly happened. But for the most part, we've designed this kind of machinery to like reliably perform on, on both parties' sides. Um, I understand where you're coming from in terms of like um, the performance here is for the person putting in the quarters is like there's not really any performance after the kind of acceptance of the offer with the um, by putting the gumball like putting the quarter in the gumball machine. So let's imagine like instead of loan contract. Okay, so um, folks are certainly working on like loan contracts on Ethereum, right? And there each party kind of has an obligation which is um, I pay my monthly installments on my loan, and in exchange, maybe the bank has, like a, it's a revolving door loan, and, and they continue to extend me loans. Um, so here, if I do not make my payments to this like, smart contract, and the smart contract might hold some virtual currency, it can be programmed such that um, it, I don't make my payments, it doesn't replenish my loan. And there's no way for me to go in and recode it. I think that's the kind of idea. There's no way for me to go in and recode that smart contract because it's on this like distributed ledger of the blockchain to, to tell it to pay me even, to tell it to reissue a loan even though I have not made my current loan payment. So I, I completely understand where you're coming from. It can be kind of hard to visualize like how both parties have uh, obligations under some of these smart contracts. The gumbo example. Yeah, um, yeah. The gumball, mach the vending machine is like this kind of one that folks get because it's because it's kind of so simple. But at the same, at the same time, I understand how it's a little lopsided. But I guess not every, not each and every single one of these conditions have to be met. Like so, for instance, So under Nick's model, these are great questions, by the way, and everyone should feel free to chime in. Like, so under Nick's kind of model, and this is like an ideal model of smart contracts that I think you'll hear from a lot of people. The idea is that, and again, the, the ideal, and this is very messy getting there, and I'm going to kind of like talk about that a little bit. Because some promises and obligations inside a contract are very hard to port into software and hardware. But in an ideal world, you, are, you would take everyone's obligations, because um, you know, a contract is really like a set of promises that we're exchanging. In an ideal world, you take all of those promises, port them onto some kind of software and hardware, and in such a way that they become kind of unbreachable. Um, yeah, so, so, so see if, I think I'll hit some more examples and like see if it kind of fleshes things out. Yes, Brett. Yeah, Brett, sure. <coughs> Yeah. But are smart contracts uh, necessarily efficient? In other words, smart contracts can be quite dumb if, in fact, breach is sufficient. So contract law enables yep. in all, many cases to breach, right? Yep. And, you know, so you can think of difficulty examples and think about it. So I just wonder if, if 
that is uh, something that kind of pops up in those first few decimals, smart contracts versus contract law. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, contract law, you know, we kind of take it for granted, but it's it's very nuanced beast, right? And it's been developed over like 500 years, literally. So, um, that's a good example of like when we take kind of, and I, and I will talk about this, um, when we t inside the kind of world of smart contracts t try to recreate contract law, which is different than what what's happening with Nick's kind of vision of smart contracts. And these are two kind of competing paradigms, and this is what I'm actually going to kind of talk about next, which is, you know, if you are getting to a paradigm where you don't just think that smart contracts should kind of enhance or perfect smart contract law, but you think that they should maybe replace it, then there, there's a whole lot of nuanced nuances that go into that. Um, and one of them is the one that you're talking about, which is sometimes we want people to be able to breach. Um, it's, it's an economic thing for us sometimes as a society to let people breach contracts and just pay damages, right? And in a world where the smart contracts we're creating are immutable, um, you can get into a lot of trouble there, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's a perfectly legitimate issue to raise. And it's, it's kind of like speaks to like kind of what, what I'm trying to talk about today with these like different paradigms. And, and I don't think somebody like Bravo would say smart contracts should replace everything in contract law. They're, they're applicable in certain circumstances, not in others, and, and narrowly in some, broadly in others. Sure, yeah. sure. Okay, let's forge ahead. Um, so, so like I was saying, with, with Nick's kind of definitions, and this is a, a thinking that you will find is very common with folks, um, the, the idea is that maybe smart contracts have arrived to help along contract law and to help maybe perfect this idea of contracts. And I'm using the word perfect there, and I just kind of want to like explain that a little bit. Um, if you go back, um, you know, as far back as, as Hobbes' Leviathan, for example, uh, it's been asserted that the very purpose of contracts is to deter what you call opportunistic breach, right? So uh, what is opportunistic breach? Well, the idea is that we can have, we can make an agreement. Um, we can have a covenant. Um, it, it, but if it's just words, then as soon as it becomes economically rational for one of us to breach that covenant, then it's essentially meaningless because one of us will breach it. So contract law comes along to compel people to abide by the covenant even when it becomes economically rational to breach. So that's called, uh, that, that is the idea of opportunistic breach. And the nice thing about smart contracts is, like Nick says, like they make this kind of opportunistic breach, which arguably contract law has as its, as its core goal to deter, it makes that kind of breach almost impossible. Um, and maybe even impossible. So th that's kind of, um, you know, I think s for some folks, like, they'll, s they'll assert that, like, smart contracts in a way, like, kind of perfect contract law. So this is one paradigm of thinking. Um, and under it, one thing to, like, briefly note is that in this world, contract law and smart contracts can coexist, right? Um, if, smart, if smart contracts enhance contract law, then then there's no real friction between the two. There's still some kind of thorny issues, and I'll talk about those a little bit later. Uh, another paradigm which I think took me to caught on, it, it took me a little while for me to catch on. And part of that is I think just, you know, as a lawyer, you kind of cling to this notion that smart contracts are here to help along contract law. Um, as you get deeper into it, and I can remember actually there was this kind of uh, like eureka moment for me. I was at a conference and it was kind of all lawyers and then like one, uh, it was a smart contracts kind of conference and it was, it was all lawyers and then one sort of gentleman from a business background. And he, I can remember him saying like, you know, I, I don't understand all this like talk about laws. Like, you know, for me, like smart contracts are, are a way to create rules that have like nothing to do with legal contracts. And kind of, you know, I kind of stewed on that for a while and then I, I came to see that like, this is a, a trend that others have observed um, as well. So um, Aaron Wright, who I know is a colleague of Brett's at Cardozo, and Primavera de Filippi, um, you know, they had a paper out in 2015, which I think is becoming a book. And, 
And as they note, you know, it, and I'll just quote, quote their text here, in some cases, smart contracts represent the implementation of a contractual agreement whose legal provisions have been formalized into source code. That's kind of like what I'm talking about with Nick Szabo, right? In other cases, smart contracts introduce new codified relationships, which are not linked to any underlying contractual rights or obligations. Um, and I have another good friend, Andrew Miller, who's now at uh, UIUC. Um, and he kind of wrote me this in an email, and this like really registered with me too. When Zabo envisions smart contracts, the legal sense of the contract is still in the picture. And we saw that with this definition. It's just executed by a computer or other you know, hardware or software. Its uses has, has drifted away for a really simple reason. Um, and, and here, Andrew kind of credits, credits the rise of like, the blockchain as being like a catalyst here. If you have a digital currency, you can enforce the terms of a contract without needing legal involvement at all. So the term smart contract in modern usage has drifted from an implementation of a contract, which is again what we saw with Nick, to something that is not a contract but is a viable replacement for contracts and many usages. Um, and I think, and obviously this echoes, uh, I'm sure all of you guys are familiar with you know, Larry Lessig's kind of code is law paradigm of thinking and the idea that um, we can use computer code to create like new sets of rules ones that sit uh, outside of the usual, like our legal, our usual legal system. So obviously this echoes, echoes that kind of thinking. I think it's very, very popular. Um, and me and Bob had this quick conversation before we started about the fact that you will hear folks t using the term smart contract, especially in the Ethereum community, uh, to talk about things that are really just applications or really just sets of rules. Um, for things like business processes or honestly even games. Um, and I, I do think, I think I kind of like ignored this way of thinking for a while, but I do think this is kind of an important paradigm when it comes to smart, smart contracts. And you know, again, like I think of this as the kind of smart contracts are here not to perfect the law, not to enhance it, but they're just here to accompany it as like a new set of rules. Uh, with all those kind of qualities that we talked about before, automatic enforcement, et cetera. And I, I also want to note that like one kind of overarching sentiment in this paradigm is I think just kind of indifference, you know, the kind of urge to create lightweight and um, efficient new systems of system of rules without involving a bunch of lawyers, you know. Um, so this paradigm, you know, it, in theory, it can kind of coexist with contract law, right? Like, at least until there's a conflict of some sort, uh, we have coexisting sets of rules in our own society, um, federal laws and state laws being one. And when there is a conflict, we have things like the supremacy clause to kind of iron out um, which one wins. Uh, so I think these two can coexist. At some point, you might have a conflict. We don't really know how that's going to be resolved at this point. Um, but I, I think the same problem uh, can be observed in a much more pressing way when you get to the third kind of paradigm of thinking. Um, and this is actually really commonplace. Um, I think a lot of folks, the way they envision the relationship between smart contracts and contract law is that smart contracts are here to replace contract law. And here it's kind of useful to remember that uh, especially all of these blockchain smart contracts and the blockchain itself come, they were born in this kind of crucible, this like cypherpunk cruci crucible, right? Which is um, this notion that we can use code to kind of create these new laws and new societies even, right? And this is certainly a sentiment that really underlines like much or, or is subscribed to by much of uh, the blockchain community and the smart contract community, community. and certainly the Bitcoin community. Um, it's definitely there, and I think you'll, you'll read things like, let's replace courts. Um, the media tends to like kind of latch onto this kind of paradigm of thinking in a very alarmist way, and you'll read articles like, could smart contracts render the state powerless? So could we, you know, can we replace not just paper contracts, but, but judges and courts and maybe even government someday uh, with smart contracts? So the problem with this 
kind of paradigm of thinking um, is a coexistence obviously becomes a little more dif difficult, right? Because now you're actively competing with, um, you're competing with contract law. And in theory, they can coexist for a while too, maybe until there's a conflict. But fundamentally, these two things are at loggerheads under this kind of paradigm of thinking. Um, so each of these paradigms of thinking, which I've kind of identified here, has its own kind of thorns. It has its own kind of issues. And I think when you're kind of looking at the relationship of um, contract law and smart contracts, it's really useful to, to like use these paradigms as kind of like you're told into thinking what are the relevant contract law issues. Um, you know, for example, so if we subscribe to um, the par paradigm that smart contracts are here to infor and enhance contract law, like an immediate question is, well, do courts subscribe to this paradigm as well? And will they enforce these things? There is, I won't get into it. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that courts would enforce smart contracts. They've been pretty uh, religious about enforcing other kinds of digital agreements, like click wrap agreements. Uh, obviously, a click wrap agreement is ingested a lot differently than a blob of code. Um, and we don't know quite how this will pan out. One second, Brett. Um, but, but this is the kind of issue that if we subscribe to the paradigm that smart contracts are here to enhance contract law, this is interesting to us, right? This is important to us. If we subscribe to the paradigm that contracts are here to replace contract law, smart contracts are here to replace contract law, this is basically like of no interest to us. Brett. So could you say something about the contract formation for smart contracts? It's just something I just have no idea. Yeah. Why Sure. So um, I'll, I'll riff on it a little bit. I wasn't prepared. That's a totally legitimate question. And I think it's like a complete black box to most folks. So I don't, I don't blame you for raising it. But it yeah. The, the two slides you just put up were like sure, sure. So uh, the way things work, like let's take Ethereum, for example. And again, this is just one embodiment of smart contracts. Like I worry sometimes that folks use Ethereum and smart contracts interchangeably. I would think of smart contracts more as kind of like an ideal or like a, like a concept. Ethereum is one embodiment of that. Uh, the way that we would create a contract on Ethereum is that we would write some contract code. And uh, you know, there's a bunch of like language. I mean, you're writing in a language. You know, like I used to do a lot of writing in Solidity, for example. Uh, and this is going back, but I think Solidity is closest to JavaScript. Um, you compile that down to bytecode, and that's actually what sits on the blockchain. So for example, how do we use that to create contracts? I mean, it's, it's really messy. And I'm actually like, I was, I was about to get to essentially the question you're asking, which is like, some problem, some promises that we would have in a normal, like everyday quotidian kind of contract are extremely hard to port onto software and hardware or onto the blockchain. As an example, an agreement to sublet an apartment. So we, we can go in and we can code our smart contract that lives on the blockchain to, for example, um, if it receives a payment from one party to send, let's say, a door code to another party, OK? So now we've kind of created an agreement that you, know, you will only receive, you w if you pay, <laughs> you will receive your door code key, right? Your, your, your key code. So, um, that's kind of like the hacky way that you would do it now. It's not easy on Ethereum. It's not really easy with any smart contract. And, and honestly, that was the next thing I was going to talk about. Um, if, if, if we have an, an agreement to, to sublet an apartment, right, one set of promises, which are just a promise to pay, pretty easy to port onto a smart contract. Um, we, can code, we can code it to acknowledge a payment. Um, maybe it, it checks the size of the payment. Uh, on Ethereum, we, because these objects can also hold currency, it can, it can recognize that it's received a payment. But then, like, how do we check that you have actually given access to the person who paid you for your apartment, who subletted your apartment? 
it's very difficult. You can't obviously do it on the blockchain. Um, I know the center is really interested in Internet of Things, and this is one really good toehold for Internet of Things with regard to smart contracts and with regard to Ethereum, is kind of using the Internet of Things to kind of um, build these promises that are very hard to port onto a contract, into contracts. So for example, uh, this, um, this is, I, I, I mean, this company Slocket, now they're most known for setting up this disastrous, enormous smart contract to the DAO. But before that, their main product was this um, like lock for a door that it could interact with a smart contract. So now we could code a smart contract to recognize that one person had paid it and then to send a signal to this door to like let a person into the apartment. Is that kind of like fleshing things out? But I don't, I don't like that is such a good question and it's, it's so much harder. I mean, I spent, like just to give you some background, you know, I came into this as, as a lawyer who was studying computer science and you know, I was tasked with kind of looking at how to actually build contracts and like started teaching myself solidity and so forth and how to write these things and you quickly realize there's this crazy choreography that you have to do to hammer hammer what are very quotidian uh, contract terms that we all use every day like onto the blockchain. It's, it's, a, it's gymnastics. Um, and I think that when folks, like folks have these very idealistic views of where smart contracts can go, they, this is one thing they're often ignoring is like, how hard it is to get most contractual terms <laughs> onto these things. Yeah. Uh, are there other issues in here? Well, what are challenges inherent in either paradigm? For instance, uh, so who maintains that? Yeah, these are great questions. You're talking here kind of about Ethereum, like about this kind of blockchain smart contract platform. Okay. So there is yeah, it's either based and there is new commands and it doesn't recognize it and it doesn't run. Um, so you never actually receive the service that you ordered and paid for. No, this is this and, is excellent. I mean sorry, just to throw it all out, but yeah. um I mean there's a question mark around who's involved with Bitcoin. Like if you're speaking to uh, speaking directly from a third party, yeah. Um, because, you know, to cause all this to happen, like who is gonna sue? Like who's gonna have damage? These are great questions. Like if you guys are having all having these questions inside your head, that's perfect. Um, these are fundamental questions and honestly people who have been studying this for years and are very involved with the movement like are kind of like trying to iron out uh, the same question. So you're 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 right. I, I think when you're talking about updates you're not talking about kind of like the architecture of the system. Updating that has been proved like like a fairly stable um, enterprise. But like when it comes to like the actual contracts themselves, um, you we write up some kind of contract. We put it out there on the blockchain. That's it, it's immutable, right? So if there's a coding error, there is no way to update it. Um, and this has happened numerous times. Uh, so I, I think we're getting relatively short on time. So I'll just kind of like short circuit the conversation a little bit. <laughs> You know, what me and Bob have been referring to a little bit is over the summer, there's a thing uh, that some of you may have read about, which was uh, this enormous smart contract. Honestly, like the 10 pole smart contract, the biggest one, uh, just in terms of at least publicity, if not like size, although it was endowed at, at one point with like $250 million worth of virtual currency. And uh, it was a contract that kind of mimicked uh, these crowdfunding platforms, right? It's called the DAO. Uh, they issued it to the blockchain. How many people are familiar with this? Okay. So um, it ended up having like a little quirk in the coding. I don't want to call it an error, but it, there was a way essentially to drain funds from this contract. And someone exploited it to the tune of $50 million worth of virtual currency. Um, and the news was all over it. And the thing is like they couldn't do anything about it because this code had been issued to the immutable blockchain. Uh, there, was, there was just nothing that could be done. Uh, so I'll skip ahead a little bit, because I think I'm down to like, I'm down to 20 minutes, and, and I want to leave some, some more time for questioning and answering. But this, this exact topic was the subject of a lot of my work for 
IC3, which is the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies with Contracts, a partnership between Cornell and a couple other folks. And it was looking at these kinds of unforeseen eventualities, which is like all kinds of things happen with these contracts once you put them out there in the wild. It could be everything from in inequitable results, which is one way of framing what's happened with the DAO, uh, a mistake, fraud, just all kinds of things happen when you put these things out in, in the wild. And contract law has, for some time, had these like very well-owned set of tools for, for undoing and altering contracts once they're out there in the wilderness. You may have heard of these things like reformation, rescission. So I spent a lot of time working with Ari Jules, he's an amazing pr crypto professor at Cornell, working on kind of mimicking some of these contract law tools on the blockchain and um, making sure that something like the DAO has like these escape hatches, even when it's been issued, whether those are escape hatches that like help you alter it or update it, maybe that's kind of what you're referring to, or just like completely undo it. Um, and actually, this is me almost a year ago, 11 months ago, encouraging people to provide off switches um, like along the lines of rescission. This is me at DevCon 1 for Ethereum. They just had DevCon 2, but <coughs> nobody listened to me. Uh, so, yeah, and so this, this DAO was out there with no, like, no way to undo it. Um, let me think. I'm just going to kind of like readjust a little bit, recalibrate, given like how much time there is left. And these questions are spectacular. This is exactly the way you guys should be thinking about these things. Um, just to take a step back, we're kind of, we're issuing these immutable things to this now very, like, to this gigantic system. And we have to all be thinking about these very carefully. And we have to be asking the exact same kind of questions that you guys are bringing here today. So you're all thought leaders on this. I, I mean, yeah, sure. Um, you don't need to worry about investor compatibility in these contracts. There never is a malevolent breach of contract. I mean, there, there can be bugs in the contract, but nobody can, it's a smart contract, so there's no way around it. So there's no bugs. There's no punishments. Um, I, I mean, so take, for example, let, let's say you did malevolently breach a contract, okay? Um, there is, you're right, like, uh, especially since this is a pseudonymous system, and that I think was something that you were referring to as well, um, you know, like on a system like Ethereum, everyone's just known by their, like, account stream, okay? Yeah, in theory, you could revert back to contract law, and you could go and sue somebody in a court. So it, this hasn't happened yet to my knowledge, but I haven't seen any legal fallout of this whole thing with the DAO, the DAO yet. Like I haven't heard, seen, heard of any actual lawsuits. In theory, you could go to a court and ask for a redress, even when one of these smart contracts went awry. One of the kind of like thorny issues there is that especially if you're subscribing to the paradigm that says smart contracts are here to replace contract law, then it, it seems definitely hypocritical to go back now to the courts because, and I mean, this is something that came up um, amidst you know the DAO, right? Um, when we write bad code, just like we can write bad contracts, uh, we can write bad code just like when we write bad contracts, and what happens is we need those plus deal reports to save us. This was kind of like a common sentiment when the thing with the DAO was happening is like, we can't go back to the courts. We can't go back to the, you know, the brick and mortar courts. Like so many of us are here to try to replace right. them. We're not them. We're not them. And actually like what happened is actually maybe even a worse solution than going back to brick and mortar courts, which is that the community agreed to fork the Ethereum blockchain. So, so, so essentially like to rewind the tape on the blockchain and go back to an earlier point before the DAO. That was the solution. Um, and who made that solution? You know, on some level, you could argue that it was like mob rule. You know, it was like the, the Ethereum community came to that decision. I mean, these are really smart, really smart folks. Majority decision on their headline said unanimously. It wasn't unanimous. Yeah, sure. And that's what's funny about this. Sure. So, so, I mean, you could see that kind of reaction going horribly wrong. I, I mean, I, I think in this case, most folks are pretty thoughtful about it. It's a very thoughtful community, very smart folks. But, you know, if we have a system where we're saying, like, we can't go back to courts, 
what else can we do? Sometimes the uh, alternative is could be worse. Does, does that kind of answer? So I, I mean, again, these are all great questions. This thing is really evolving. It's evolving very fast. Um, I think if everyone leaves this room and, and just they say, well, hey, I need to keep an eye on this, and we all need to like kind of be thinking about it more, um, then I think it's kind of worth coming down here from New York for that alone. Um, let me just like kind of wrap this up, and I'll, I'll leave some more time for just random questions, because um, I understand that a lot of this is a little confusing, and I'm happy to provide just like any more basic background. My kind of like, con like you know, my kind of thesis for the day, right, is that um, people come into smart contracts with different expectations about them and different ideas of what their purpose is. And I think that those different ideas um, influence or, or give birth to these different paradigms of thinking of the relationship between smart contracts and smart contract law. That in turn really shapes what kind of issues are of interest to you. I mean, even that last thing that we talked about where we're talking about, well, we don't want to go back to courts because we're trying to replace them. So let's think of other solutions. Um, that is That falls purely into this paradigm where we're trying to replace courts. And on the flip side of things, if you're kind of here, if you think that smart contracts are here to enhance contracts and contract law, then you're interested in things like, will courts enforce them? How do I turn my paper contract into a smart contract so that it's still legally enforceable? And those kinds of things. Um, I think it's just, it deserves a lot more thought. And I mean, one other kind of thing to think about here is like, we also might even think, and this is a little radical, but like we might even wonder whether folks who had such different ideas of smart contracts and such different ways of thinking about their relationship to contract law should be on the same blockchains, should have their smart contracts on the same blockchains, or should be, you know, should be clustered in the same communities, or whether it'd be more advantageous for them to kind of like, you know, create blockchains or at least create communities around these different paradigms of thinking. So that that kind of wraps up for lectures. I did see a lot of little hands, and I'm happy to answer uh, for the lecture. I'm I'm happy to answer like any questions. It can be basic questions. I know that a lot of these smart contract and blockchain talks leave people feeling even more clueless than before they started. And I that would be the worst case scenario. So even elemental questions are okay. Yes, Bob. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, 